of the writing of books, there is no end. Hello and welcome to the Wretched Road Trip. We're here at the University of Georgia, Athens. I just came out of the library. Now I'm told that this is a building where they have lots of books. The kids go in there, they read, they study, they learn lots of stuff. I guess, because <laughs> I really never spent a whole lot of time in something like that. Here's my question for you. All of these books that have been written by men, who gets to say that they're right? Who gets to say that they are correct? Who is the authority? You see, these days on a campus like this at University of Georgia Athens, and it is a gorgeous campus, who is the one who gets to determine what is the correct worldview? Now, a secular humanist will tell you basically, well, you know, well, I get to. Okay, why? Who's the authority? Well, basically, self is the authority. When we approach it from a Christian worldview, we get to say, no, 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 there's an objective authority. It is God, because if there is no objective authority, first of all, you can't know what is right and wrong. Second of all, ultimately, then you're just going to get human beings squabbling. This is the international symbol for squabbling right there, because there is no objective authority. Now, we're going to talk to this fellow who I have not met yet. Is that correct, young man? I have not met you, correct? Hi, I'm Reese. Reese, nice to meet you. Hold on. Let me take my little microphone here. Reese, what are you studying here at UGA? Uh, right now, I'm studying for a religion test. I have right now in like an hour. Really? Yeah. Why are you studying religion? Um, because I'm required by my major. You have to. I have to. Did you want to? Um, I don't mind it. All right, now I'm fascinated. So you're taking religion, mm -hmm. and is it all religions that you're studying? Uh, right now it's uh, Islam, uh, Christianity, and uh, I think Muslim. Uh, it's the same as Islam. A Muslim. Uh, uh, Islam, sorry. Um, uh, Buddhism. No. Hinduism. It's... No. Mormonism. <laughs> um, Shintoism. And what, what is it? Is what Oprahanity. <laughs> the religion of Oprah Winfrey. Okay. <laughs> Um, no, it was, um... Do you think all religions are the same? Maybe. All right, if I told you, Islam says you've got to keep five pillars of the faith, mm -hmm. and then maybe, just maybe, when you die, Allah might be pleased, you will potentially go to heaven if you've done those things perfectly, and you will inherit 72 virgins. Mm -hmm. That's basically a summary of Islam in the afterlife. Fair enough? Fair. All right. Christianity says all the things that you do to try to earn your way to heaven are actually self-righteous. They're sinful because we have a corrupt, sinful nature. Everything we do is sinful and wrong, and God must judge us, and there's no way we can earn our way to heaven. But if we repent and put our trust in his son, Jesus Christ, then it will be a gift given to us based on the works of Jesus and not on our works because all of our works are like filthy rags. It's a little summary of Christianity. Do you think those two religions are the same? Different in detail, but it's more basically the same. How? You're going to somewhere. You're going to heaven. Or... Oh, okay, okay. But that would be like me saying, okay, you're wearing a shirt, I'm wearing a shirt, therefore we're the same. That's true. Okay, so basically one says you got to work there, maybe. The other one says it's a free gift of God because of Jesus Christ, by grace alone. Okay, then not, they're different. All right. Do you think they're both valid? I'm an atheist, so I think they're valid... Um, ideas, but I don't think that they're... Uh, Do you think they're wrong? Um, yes. Good on ya! Well, you do. Yeah. I appreciate that. Okay, so you think they're wrong. All right, so you're an atheist. You believe there's no God, period. I believe there's no God. All right. I'm going to try to convert you to being an agnostic. Okay, and I, I know what that means. All right. <laughs> an agnostic means you just don't know for sure. Yeah. All right. Atheist, basically, A, negates the word theism, which is God. So there's no God. That's your position. Definitively, there's no God. But to maintain that position, you have to have all knowledge of everything that is happening, has happened, what's going on on Mars, what's going on in Nebraska, which really pretty much the same landscape. You have to know everything about everything to definitively state there is no God. Do you have all knowledge of everything? No. Therefore, there's a chance that God could exist. Yes. You just don't know. I just don't know. Congratulations, you're an agnostic. All right, I'm an agnostic. Dude, you backslid right here on this bench. All right, did you grow up in a Christian home? I grew up in a Catholic home um, and actually did call myself an agnostic a couple years back and switched it over to atheism just because I didn't want to believe in any kind of God. How come, dude? Um, I don't know. I 
I, I think I'm a logical minded person and I like to have proof for what I think. So I guess I'm just saying against what atheist is. And now that I'm just saying that I'm agnostic because I don't have proof that there isn't a God, so I can't say that I'm an atheist. So I'm just contradicting myself. But, you, but that's okay. But you, you wanted to demonstrate that God doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Why don't you like the idea of God? I think it gives false hope. I think that when you die, you probably not gonna just gonna be in the ground or dirt. So you want some evidence to prove that God exists? Yes. How much do you need? Um, probably some pretty solid evidence. All right. If I could give you a ton of evidence, do you think you'd be convinced that God exists? A miracle? A miracle. Maybe a miracle. Um, All right. I got a miracle for you. You're looking through them right now, your eyes. Mm -hmm. Over 100 million light-sensitive cells right behind your eyeball, all working in coordination so that you can see, take in this information and process it in your brain so you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. That wasn't luck. That's a miracle. You're made by God. Or I was made by evolution. And I mean, just the same way that animals evolved and... I understand, but the consider the symmetry of your eyes. Yeah, I understand, but how, did it, how does a rock or how does somebody who doesn't even understand the refraction of light know that there's light out there somehow to determine that I can comprehend what's in front of me? I don't even know what the concept of sight is if I don't see anything. Okay, you don't even see darkness when you're blind. You, you don't see anything. You just, there's nothing. So how would this bench know that there's something out there to be seen and then go about the business of evolving eyes. Are you saying a bench can evolve? <laughs> well, ultimately, you evolved supposedly from a rock because you came from something that didn't have life into life. So somehow you jumped from being a rock to being a human being. Okay. So somehow we came up with the idea that there's stuff out there to be seen and I can process it. I don't think that could all happen by luck and chance. I think that it takes so much design, so much complexity. Somebody had to design it and put you together. And so that I think is your miracle, but I think there's even more. I think you got a whole universe. This whole thing is so complex and so marvelously made. You have to just look at it and go, you know, there's a microphone maker. I've never met the guy, I've never been to the factory, but there must be a microphone maker because there's a microphone. Mm -hmm. There must be a universe maker because there's a universe. I think the universe screams to you, God exists. How's that for proof? Uh, I think the universe is very, very good argument. Um, but the Big Bang is also a great argument. I'm going to try to right now circumvent your intellect. And I'm going to go to a different part of your brain. Okay. Instead of your intellect, I want to go to your conscience. It's that area in your brain that goes, this is wrong. This is right. This is good. This is bad. And I want to try to poke at it a little bit, okay, and see if we can stir you in your conscience. Now, I was looking at this. This is the books of the New Testament, and it describes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, you said also that you like Judaism. You were studying Judaism as one of your world religions, correct? When the Old Testament, which is the Torah for the Jewish people, the laws of Moses, do you know what those are? I can remember. Ten Commandments. Okay. Right. Do you know the Ten Commandments? I do. All right. Give me a couple. Um, thou shalt not steal. Stop right there. Have you ever broken that commandment? Yes. You've stolen something. Mm -hmm. right. If you knew that I stole something, what name would you give to me? What would you label me? A thief. Give me another commandment. Um, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Stop right there. You ever done that? Um. You ever covet, desired anything that didn't, forget the neighbor's wife, anything that didn't belong to you? Uh, of course. So you're a coveter also? Mm -hmm. Give me another commandment. Um, thou shalt not idolatrize, isn't it? That's right, committed, yeah, to, to make a graven image mm -hmm. because God wants your affections to be for him, the one who made you and gave you life. Mm -hmm. Have you committed idolatry? Um, well, growing up as a Catholic, I feel like I have. Um, but has God always been the primary affection in your life where you've been living for him, honoring him with everything you do? No. Give me another commandment. Um, thou shalt not um, murder. Have you ever done that? No. Right. Let me tell you what Jesus said. He said that if you just call somebody an idiot, a moron, you just yeah, mad at somebody, you're in danger of the judgment mm -hmm. because that makes you a murderer at heart. You don't commit the act, but that anger God sees 
very similar to murder at the heart. Now, it's not as gross a sin, mm -hmm. clearly, but it's still a violation of God's law and his perfect standard. Have you ever murdered somebody in your heart? Uh, I don't think I could in my heart. Do you drive a car? I do. Ever been mad at somebody down the road? Um, I have. All right, so have you committed murder in your heart? I think that's a stretch. <laughs> All right, let me try another one. All right, Jesus said, if you look with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. No, you look like a normal guy, so I'm just going to trust that maybe you've violated that commandment, but it's none of my business. Okay? okay? All right? All right, so we just did a little summary of the commandments. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes people think you keep the commandments, and then God will accept you when you get to heaven. But here's what we've learned about you and me. We've broken those commandments. Mm -hmm. So what do you think a just and holy God should do with people who have broken his laws? Um, well, obviously, we have a forgiving God. Hold on. What should a righteous, holy God do, a judge who's going to judge the whole world in righteousness, what should he do with lawbreakers like you and me? He should punish them. What is the place of punishment according to the Bible? Hell. So, Reese, if you died, God is your judge, the books are open, he knows your thoughts, deeds, everything done in darkness, your whole life displayed before him, nothing hidden, he'd find you guilty. What do you think God would do with you? He'd send me straight to hell. That's depressing. It is if you believe in hell. Well, it's, it, it doesn't matter if you believe in it. If it's true, whether you believe in it or not, mm -hmm. it's a depressing thought because you'd be going whether you believe in it or not, right? Yeah. All right. Because my belief or lack thereof doesn't change reality. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, in the Old Testament, there was a lot of talk about a Messiah mm -hmm. to come. The New Testament reveals that Messiah as? Uh, Jesus Christ. That's right. If you remember in the Old Testament, there were a lot of lamb sacrifices. Mm -hmm. You had the Passover. <clears throat> you had the Day of Atonement. And they would kill a lamb for the covering of sins. And it was a fuzzy picture of something better to come. It was all pointing towards something else. There was a guy named John the Baptist who walked the earth at the time of Jesus. And he pointed to Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All those fuzzy pictures in the Old Testament of lamb sacrifices were pointing toward the one, the perfect lamb, who was going to die Jesus on the cross. for the, that's right, Jesus on the cross, for the forgiveness of sins. So the Messiah came to save you from the wrath that you will face if you die in your sins. That's the gospel of Christianity, mm -hmm. that you can't do anything to earn your way to heaven. You've earned hell for yourself, but Jesus, because of his perfect life, and his perfect righteousness, taking the wrath of the Father on your behalf, the punishment you deserve, he took for you, even though he knew you were going to look with lust, that you would be a coveter, that you'd be an idolater. He loved you and died for you anyway. Rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. And now this day, he commands you to repent and put your trust in him. And he says, if you will do that, he will completely forgive your sins, and he will inherit you and adopt you as his child. That's the good news of the gospel, mm -hmm. right? Now, here's my question for you. Why would you reject that? Um, that's a tough question. I, yeah, I, you, it's hard to reject it. Um, God, dying for you, even though you've sinned against him, mm -hmm. Can you think of an act that anybody has ever done for you that has demonstrated a greater love than that? Um, no. Maybe, maybe just my, my mother's love. Yeah. But imagine a, a, somebody that you've offended, that you've willfully rebelled against, kind of shaking your fist at and said, don't care, don't care, I'm going to live it my way and I'm going to put my affections toward other things, died for you anyway. Now, the question that I asked before we took a little break, why would you reject that kind offer, that he is willing to forgive you? Um, there's not many logical reasons why you would. Um, but... Maybe you uh, don't believe in all of his rules. Um, I know there's a, a lot of sins that are um, pretty daily and normal life, and it's not that I'm rejecting his 
acceptance, but I'm living my life. You prefer living by your set of rules rather than God's set of rules? Uh, yeah. Okay. See if this does anything for you, okay? Sometimes people's perception of Christianity is that it's about keeping rules, all right? And God is kind of a, you know, authoritarian, and he wants you to live like this, and he just wants to steal all the fun from our lives. Maybe just to position this a little bit differently. If God was willing to die for you, and he is the most amazingly kind, loving being in the universe, wouldn't it really be a joy and a delight to follow him and his rules because we're grateful for him? Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, if I believed in him, then I would be grateful. Um, but I don't. Here's a, here's, a, here's a question that Jesus asked. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his very soul? Your soul, the thing that lives on for forever. Mm -hmm. It's precious, right? It is. All right. So let's say you have whatever it is that you want to do, whatever things that you want to mm -hmm. participate in that you enjoy today. If at the end of your life you stand before God, the books are open, and he looks at you and says you're guilty. You have broken my rules and you knew it. There was a guy who sat on a bench with you when you were going to University of Georgia Athens and he pleaded with you mm -hmm. to turn from your sins and put your trust in my son and you rebelled and you wouldn't do it even though your conscience said I know I've done wrong and I know I've got a problem with my court date. You lived your whole life for yourself anyway. Mm -hmm. Will it have been worth it? Um, I think my love for life and the life that I live is stronger than any regret that I'll ever have. Um, I feel like I have so much passion to live and pursue my own happiness, uh, not out of selfishness, but out of um, life short. Let me, let me try to be specific. Are you saying that you want to just live your life any way that you want to, that's, that's your desire, or you just you don't like the idea of God's rules and, and just taking all the fun away from you? What exactly are you, are you trying to say here? Um, I think I want to live my life. Um, his his rules are one thing, but... So, let's just pick something. Okay. Partying. partying. All right, you don't want to give up partying. No, love partying. Okay, so could I boil it down this way? You love partying more than the God who died for you. <laughs> um, I, yes. So you like partying more than Jesus. But I like happiness more than I like Jesus. Yeah, you know what? I... I connect happiness to the things that I do and I live my life every day in the pursuit of happiness and it's that's the one thing that defines my life is happiness and if I'm living a miserable life which I am not a hundred percent is gonna continue on to an afterlife why would I want to live such a short life in unhappiness yeah. well I was trying to I was trying to poke at your conscience remember mm -hmm. try to get there so that you go you know I I do know that I've been doing wrong. I do know that my life has been wrong. Mm -hmm. I've got a universe that tells me there's a God. My conscience tells me I've sinned against him. So you've got all kinds of intellectual and you've got all kinds of conscience issues going on inside of your brain, but you're suppressing that, that, that obvious knowledge because you, Reese, basically want to be the God of your life. Yes. Fair enough, all right? I can't force you to do anything. I mean, it looks like you could take me anyway. All right, I can't force, and that's and that's not what Christianity is about. It's not a turn or burn. That's not the message of Christianity. The message is, yeah, if you don't turn, you will go to hell. But God's so kind, He died to save you, and we should want to repent and put our trust in Him because, wow, who wouldn't want to believe and follow that God? As you go through life, whether it's today or in months or years to come, as you start to realize the vanity of what life is when you have your next hangover or you wake up with your next heartbreak and you start to realize it's all very temporal and fleeting and your conscience troubles you, think about what I shared with you today because God's offer stands for you. If you'll repent and put your trust in Jesus, as wicked as you've been, whatever it is that you've done, he will completely forget it and forgive you because he's that good. That's all I can say to you. I will take that to heart. Fair enough. You are a gentleman. Really, you are. And you're patient. Thanks for not thumping me.